I'm Rear Admiral Thomas M. Dyke is retired. This chapter of the silent service tells of a struggle of a captain and a crew against enormous odds. It is a story of men who never lost faith in themselves or their ship. The tougher the going, the tougher they became in a situation where lesser men would have tossed in the sponge. In the early months of 1942, the Japanese Navy steamed into the Dutch East Indies. Like a steamroller going down an incline, their gun crews at first encountered little opposition as they blasted everything in their path. In this advance, every operable American ship in the area was put into action. Many of our ships had been at sea for months with little opportunity to replace worn out parts or to effect much needed repairs. Such was the condition of the USS Tarpon as she left the port of Darwin in January 1942 for duty in the vital Manipa Strait area. Like a tiger without claws, the Tarpon limped northward in search of the enemy. On the fifth day, the captain, Lieutenant Commander Lewis Wallace of Quero, Texas, received additional bad news from his engineering officer, Lieutenant Jack Morrow. The number two main engine's acting up again, sir. I'm afraid I'm going to have to take it off the line. All right, let me know as soon as you find out what the trouble is. Aye, right, sir. Well, Jack, that exhaust valve leakage taken care of yet? Well, not yet, sir. Besides that, the drain pump just broke down. We've been bailing out the engine room bilges by hand. Well, what else can happen? This whole ship's like a fighter who's taken one punch too many. She's going on guts alone. Well, let's hope she can hang on to the rounds over. I hear the only thing that's holding our engines together is a few sticks of chewing gum. Do you think they'll hold out till the patrol's over, Chief? Well, kid, if the top can stay afloat with fats here aboard her, we got nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah, too bad you guys don't pay for my services by the pound, and maybe you'd appreciate me. Eh. Son, if you think this is bad, you should have been with my old man in 18. They were 200 feet down below their maximum depth. The motors and the batteries were out, and four enemy destroyers were dropping ash cans on the sub. The air was very bad, and the temperature in the engine room was 140 degrees. Now, how do you suppose they got out? Gee, Fats, I don't know. How did they get out? The cook whipped up a batch of Wiener Schnitzel and sauerkraut and shot it to the surface through to the pedal tubes. And when the Germans saw it, they thought they were dropping ash cans on one of their subs. <laughs> By the 11th of February, the Tarpon had reached the heavily patrolled Ambai area. At 22.12 that night, a visual contact was made off the starboard bow. Looks like a patrol boat. Might be screened for a convoy. All stop. Secure main engines. All ahead, one third on the battery. All engines after stop. All answer ahead, one third. Answering bells on the battery. We can't take any chances on that baby picking up our exhaust sparks. Target range. 8,600 yards, sir. Closing fast. Left 10 degrees rudder, steady on 170. Left 10 degrees rudder, steady on 170. We'll keep our stern toward him. Make it tougher for him to pick us up. Range. 3,600 yards, sir. We can't wait much longer. If we don't spot a convoy soon, we'll... You changed course, Captain. Looks like he's headed right towards us. Spotted us. Turn the bridge. Dive. Dive. Level off at 200 feet. Level off at 200 feet.
right to 230. Come right to 230. Screw sounds receding, Captain. Sounds like we're losing him. Captain, lost power in the bow and stern planes. Shifting to hand operation. Well, at least he left us a rudder. We'll be able to steer a straight course. Captain, the rudder angle indicator has been knocked out. During the 17th day of February, the tarpon made less than a mile submerged due to strong currents and machinery casualties. The next day, she was running on the surface. Contact, bearing three, two, four. Come to the conning tower. Surface contact, bearing three, two, four. Surface contact, bearing three, two, four. Three, two, four. What is it, Jack? Looks like a freighter, sir. Range about 18,000 yards. Seem to be any escort around. Station tracking party. All ahead full. Answer bells and three main engines. Bearing 310. Changing to the left. He's seen us and he's turning away. We'll have to increase speed. Number two engine's still off the line, sir. The engine room's giving us everything they've got right now. For the better part of three hours, the tarpon struggled to get into position to start her attacking dive. But as the day wore on, it became evident that she was faced with a hopeless task. Range! 16,000 yards, sir. No use, Captain. As long as she maintains that course, we haven't got a chance of getting ahead of her. And the engines can't take this beating much longer. Well, you're right, Rich. If they hadn't seen us, we might have had a chance. Secure the tracking party. Secure the tracking party. This is a hard luck ship, I tell you. First our engines conk out. Then we get outrun by a fat freighter that should have been a sitting duck. And it isn't over yet. That is nothing to worry about. If worse comes to worse, we can always use the sauerkraut gag. Ah. It won't work here, Fats. We'll have to make it sukiyaki. Look, you guys can kid about it if you want, but hard luck never comes in twos. You'll see. Pull on your seats. Looks like we finally got a break. The tarpons just received orders to proceed to a new area north of Adonara. Good, that's in the heavy shipping lanes. Plenty of targets there. This time we won't have to chase them. They'll be going right over us. We've got a full load of torpedoes waiting us down. Gentlemen, looks like we're finally going to get a chance to lighten ship. At 0200 on February 24th, the tarpon was nearing the narrow bowling straits en route to her station north of Adonara Island. Lieutenant Mara had come off the 8 to 12 watch and was asleep in his bunk. In the galley, a few of the crew were sampling some of Chief Davenport's special coffee. And on the bridge, the navigator had just come up from the conning tower to keep a lookout for his landfall, the southern tip of Point Talk. We should be sighting the point any minute now, Captain. All ahead, two-thirds. All ahead, two-thirds, sir. Lookouts, keep a sharp eye out for breaking surf. Aye, aye, sir. How much longer before we change course, Rich? 10, 15 minutes. I'll know better as soon as I can see the point.
main ballast tank are being blown dry, sir. Very well. Left full rudder. Left full rudder, sir. If we don't get off by daybreak, we'll be target practice for the first enemy plane that comes along. Right full rudder. Right full rudder, sir. The engines can't take this overload much longer, Captain. All stop. All stop, sir. It's no use. Until the tide comes up, we haven't got a chance of getting off. The keel must be buried six feet deep in that coral. What's our approximate position, Rich? That's point talk off the port there. Our charts don't show a reef here. Last report from ComSub said that the Japanese task force was in this area. It could be daylight in a couple of hours, and the tide should be rising. Now, if it comes up before the enemy spots us, we'll have a chance. If it doesn't... Now, when all ships' records and classified correspondence assembled and ready for destruction... All right, sir. Every effort must be made to lighten ship. Anything that will move, I want thrown over the side. I don't need to tell you that the enemy can be expected at any time. Message, sir. Well, we've got till high tide this afternoon. If we don't get off by then, our orders ought to destroy the Tarpon. In accordance with instructions received from the Commander Submarine Southwest Pacific, preparations were made to destroy ship. The deck gun was to press towards the engine room to blow a hole in the hull plating. Demolition charges were placed in strategic points throughout the ship. Torpedo warheads were armed and rigged for detonation. Concurrent with this activity, every effort was made to lighten ship in an attempt to set her free. Fire four! <laughs> Fire five, fire six. There was an enemy ship on the other end of those babies. The screws and rudder are on damage, Captain. We have three feet of water at the bow and nine amidships. The tide's still going down. It'll be late afternoon before it comes up again. If we can get number two on the line by then, we might make it. We don't have a welcoming committee on our hands before then. Keep the gun crew stationed by the 50s. Might not be much good against a dive bomber, but it'll help morale. Aye, aye, sir. Imagine isn't just a piece of machinery. Each one's got a personality all its own. And this is about the meanest thing that ever came off an assembly line. I know what you mean, sir. You work with these babies long enough, you begin to think they're running you instead of the other way around. Well, I guess you can hardly blame them. This one's due for an overhaul over three months ago. There's not a spare bearing within a thousand miles of here. Remember those bronze main bearing saddles we were making in Darwin? Yeah. The ones we never got a chance to finish. Well, I've been working on a couple in my spare time. I'd, um, I'd like to try them, sir. Don't see what we got to lose. Mission Commander. Captain, off the port bow. They must have heard the torpedoes go off. Yeah, we're probably the first Americans they've seen. Might even think we're Japanese. You know, if the enemy's been in this area, these fellows will know about it. 
Let's see if we can get them to come alongside. Run up the flag. Aye, aye, sir. They're coming over, Captain. And that man in the bow, he doesn't look like one of the natives. Looks like... Looks like a priest. Padre, this is Lieutenant Gregory, my executive officer. And Lieutenant Marr, engineering officer. How do you do, sir? I'm very glad to meet you, gentlemen. It has been a long time since I have seen an American. A very long time. Cigarette, sir? <sighs> you can be of uh, great help to us. There are two things we need to know. The exact time of the next high tide here, and the whereabouts of the Japanese. The first answer is easy, my friends. The water is high on the beach in the late afternoon. We have no clocks here. But when the shadows of the trees reach the shoreline, you will have your best chance of getting free. We can figure on another four hours, if we can get number two working by then. Oh, Mel and the boys are working on it now, Captain. Well, what about the Japanese, Padre? We heard they have a task force in this area. I must tell you, you and your ship are in grave danger. Yesterday, the enemy fleet passed through the straits to the north of this island. There were many ships and planes. In a few weeks, Padre, this island may be swarming with enemy troops. If we're successful in getting off this afternoon, you're welcome to come with us. I am in my ninth year of the ten I was ordered to spend working with the people of this island. They have come to depend on me. My thanks, Captain. But I cannot leave. It's been a great honor to meet you, Padre. Oh, there is something you can do for me. My supplies have long since run out. If you could spare one tube of toothpaste. Padre, you can have a whole case. Plane off the starboard bow! Japanese, all right. Looks like an observation plane. Smart little monkey, staying out of range. He's going away. About an hour and a half to high tide. If we can get off before that fella comes back with his big brothers, they'll have nothing to shoot at except a lot of water. Hey, Fats. Uh, Chief, I know how we can make sure the tarpon sinks when we scuttle her. We'll borrow a dugout from the natives, see? Then we'll hoist a torpedo out, lower it down into the canoe, Fats and me will row it out a ways, point it back at the sub, trigger it off, and bam! What do you think of that? No, kid, it won't work. Oh, well, gee, it, it was just an idea. Don't feel bad, kid. The topping isn't through yet. If Whitey Miller and the boys don't get us off this rock, well, we'll, we'll just tow it back to Australia with us. <laughs> Bearings in place, sir. No, the skipper's given us permission to test it as soon as it's ready. Roll it. Don't ever tell me my boys aren't geniuses. Number two's ready to go on the line. Tell them they get free tickets to the next World Series when we get back to the States. It's on me. Shadows have reached the shoreline, Captain. Start warming up the engines, Jack. All four of them. Yes, sir. in position of stern, Captain. The tide's not going to get any higher. It's now or never. If you got a rabbit's foot lying around, Rich, now's the time to use it. Take a strain on the stern anchors! Left full rudder! Left full rudder, sir. All back emergency! Thank you. 
away, Captain. Planes off the starboard quarter. Cut the anchor, Hunter. Throw the bridge. Captain, level off at 200 feet. Level off at 200 feet. You know, Captain, right about now, I bet those pilots up there are wishing they brought spear guns with them instead of machine guns. I'll be back in a moment with our special guest. The men of the Tarpon never lost faith in their ship, and she rewarded them by coming through when the chips were down. But a ship is an inanimate thing. It was a great training and never say die spirit of a ship's company that willed her through. Now I want you to meet her executive officer, Captain Richard V. Gregory, United States Navy. Rich, knowing you had only one chance to get off that reef must have made things pretty difficult. Did you think you'd make it? It looked pretty hopeless, but we were all so busy, we didn't take time out to really dwell on our fate. I think each of us had come to the conclusion that he was going to end up as a prisoner. But as long as there were things to be done that might save our ship, no one would admit to feeling that way. The Tarpon was a fine ship. It would have been a shame to destroy her. Well, we certainly felt the same way. She was home to us. And besides, no ship's company worth its salt is going to lose a ship without the best try they know how to give. As I remember, she went on later in the war to sting the enemy pretty badly. Well, yes, she did. She was credited with two of the largest ships in the Japanese Merchant Marine. I'm sure everyone looking in will join me in congratulating you and the Tarpon Ships Company on the courageous and skillful way the Tarpon was handled during the grounding. We're all very proud of you. Well, thank you, Tommy. I hope you will be with us again when we bring you another true story of the silent service. Music